Hello again. My name is Anna DeVries. I am investigating two suspects in a series of unsolved crimes across North America. This podcast was released on the dark web to a dedicated viewership of 40 listeners. I'm re-releasing it here to involve you, the public. If you have any information about the hosts, their criminal networks, or the incidents discussed in the program, write to me at lookoutpod at gmail.com. They were last seen at a riverboat casino, the Queen Marquette in Marquette, Iowa. They are currently implicated in the robbery and abduction of a casino patron. This patron was able to escape and has provided a physical description of the hosts, along with the following anecdote describing his experience with them. Quote, They were really lovely people, and we had an amazing night. That is, until they tried to sell my head off. As always, be on the lookout. Hello, Connie and Ronnie here with another episode from the Lisping Lunatics. The dangerous duo, Los Chicos Malos. Bringing to you tales of murder most foul. Many killers bury their victims in unmarked, shallow graves, but the killers whose crimes we will explore today do something very different. Instead of burying their crimes underground, they submerge their prey underwater. It is common for serial killers to deposit their dead in a location that can be revisited. Experts will call this by different names depending on their style. A trophy garden, a souvenir chest, a monstrous memento, a macabre museum. A place of solitude where a killer can spend time with the remnants of their victims. John Wayne Gacy kept bodies in his basement. Jeffrey Dahmer kept skulls in his kitchen. The Long Island serial killer kept bodies in the bramble beside the beach parkway. The killers we will investigate today place their trophy gardens as far as a hundred feet underwater, where there was little risk of someone stumbling across it. But still, evidence of their crimes were uncovered. Join us as we explore Gardens of the Drowned. Our first killer haunted the waters of Long Island, New York. Our story takes us to June of 1996, and the annual Montauk Shark Fishing Tournament is about to commence. 150 boats set off from the marina. Captains steer their vessels 70 miles off the coastal tip of New York until they reach the canyons, vast undersea channels where the sea shelf drops off. The canyons funnel much of the biodiversity of the ocean. Schools of tuna, swordfish, and lone sharks follow its channels in search of food. It is a highway of ocean life of all sizes, deep sea coral, squid, whales, crustacean, and the like. The game of the shark fishing tournament is to be the one to hook the biggest catch of the weekend. Cash prizes await the boat who drags in the largest shark. Makos are especially prized, though any shark legally fished can qualify. Each vessel participating in the tournament is outfitted with highly specialized gear. Every boat will have a whole quiver of rods and reels and advanced sonar. Between beer and whiskey and wine and cigars, fishermen will drop in hooks as large as your hand that will be attached to stainless steel cables that can't be cut by the shark's razor-sharp teeth. These boats are a rolling and rocking collection of expensive equipment. Thousands upon thousands of dollars worth. The reel itself on the shark fishing rod can easily run in excess of a thousand dollars. Not to mention the jewelry and electronics the fishermen are bringing aboard. To charter one of these boats for the tournament can run several thousand dollars easily, so passengers are usually well to do. The cost of marine gas alone to get these boats to the canyons and back would make you shudder. All this wealth draws an unexpected visitor. Pirates. 
Mind you, these pirates are very different today than they were in the 1700s. They ride what some call cigarette boats, long, fast speedboats with four engines on the back to propel them, and they employ high-tech radar systems to find other vessels. They want what is on those fishing boats, so they wait until nightfall on the day of the tournament and blast off from coastal towns in New York, New Jersey, Connecticut, and Rhode Island toward the canyons. They scan the radar for ships and approach facing the wind so they're not heard until they're right on top of the fishing boats. They board while everyone is asleep and catch the crew off guard, waking them with a sawed-off shotgun pointed at their face. They steal the Rolexes off their wrists, the gold chains off their necks, their wedding rings, their wallets, and their smartphones. Then they begin to strip the boat. The thousand dollar reels, the GPS systems, the sonar, the bottles of Dom Perignon. The really cutthroat outfits have been known to snag the outboard motors as well, which can be worth twenty to fifty thousand dollars a piece. And a boat might have one, two, three. The pirates abandon the fishermen without a means of travel, leaving them adrift at sea. The ocean is vast. Help does not come quick. Twelve nautical miles off the coast, and you're beyond the territorial zone of the United States. You're isolated and at the mercy of the ocean. Those boats seem awfully big when you're docked, but as you get closer to the canyons, the surf doubles in size. After every crest, you feel yourself drop into the folds of dark blue sea. The horizon falls away in the trough of a wave. A wall of ocean rises around you, and you feel its power. You are helpless until the next wave crests, and that familiar line where sky meets sea greets you again. During the 96 shark fishing tournament, pirates board three boats at night and rob their passengers. It is assumed that the same crew hit all three boats, and everything went smoothly for the pirates until they boarded the third boat. The crew and passengers of the Santa Maria were familiar with these sorts of maneuvers and decided to attempt to fend off the pirates. Vin Tortorello, 56, had his Colt 1911 pistol with him, hoping to shoot some exploding bobbers he'd brought along for fun. As the pirates were shaking down him and his friends for their pocket change, Vin pulled out the gun. Once it was over, Vin's brother-in-law, Chrissy Van Zant, was on the ground with a gunshot wound to the neck. The bullet had shattered his spine, killing him within minutes. Vin was shot in his shoulder, but survived. Luckily, the pirates hadn't dismantled their engines, so the fishermen were able to navigate back to Long Island and get Vin to a hospital. Afterwards, Vin told authorities that he was sure he had hit a pirate during the volley. However, there is no record of any person matching the description he provided being admitted to a hospital in the tri-state area that night. If the pirate had been killed, he was likely dumped overboard, but these pirates are well acquainted with wannabe heroes. As it turned out, Vin's brother-in-law Chrissy was a victim of friendly fire. The ballistics experts matched the bullet lodged in Chrissy Van Zandt's C2 vertebrae to the rounds in Vin's own pistol. All three boats reported the pirates to the Coast Guard and returned to their respective ports. The authorities figured that this was the extent of the damage until a fourth boat, the Captain Jack, failed to return to its marina the next day as scheduled. The Coast Guard was called in to patrol its last known GPS coordinates. The Captain Jack had last been heard from by the boat the Giovanna, after it checked in on the radio to make sure they weren't on the same path. This is a common procedure between seafaring vessels to avoid collisions. There were no sightings of the Captain Jack. A Coast Guard cutter patrolling the area repeatedly attempted to reach its crew via radio to no avail. The search party never found the Captain Jack or its crew. The consensus from the public was that the pirates had attacked the Captain Jack prior to the gunfight on the Santa Maria. This opinion was also shared by authorities. The prevailing theory posits that the pirates board the Captain Jack and its crew attempted to fend them off, and tragically, everyone on board was killed. The families and friends of the four people lost on the Captain Jack accepted this theory, given what had happened to the other boats. But five years later, 
In 2001, a recreational vessel, the Day Skipper, carrying a group of semi-professional scuba divers, took off from a marina in center Mauritius. They shot across the Great South Bay and drove through the Mauritius Inlet and into the rocky surf of the Atlantic. They were headed for a possible crash site, where another scuba crew had reported seeing the fuselage of a Cessna airplane while spearfishing, a plane that had been reported missing a decade prior. The reported plane wreck was a few miles south of West Hampton. As the day skipper approached the area, they stumbled across a buoy. The divers assumed that the buoy was a marker left by the last party of divers, since it was so close to the coordinates given. They geared up and entered the water. The sea floor was 120 feet deep. The divers followed the buoy's line to the bottom. After scanning the sea floor for a few minutes, Marsha Johansson was surprised to find a boat wreck. Marsha surfaced and alerted her fellow divers. Marsha had identified the Captain Jack from its vinyl inscription on the stern. On her second dive, Marsha entered the cabin. The Captain Jack rested on the seafloor at a 45 degree angle. A microwave sized hole was visible in the hull and its jagged edges were charred as if a fire or explosion had done the damage. The deck was covered with sand and debris. Crabs scattered under cabinets as Marsha's flashlight bobbed inside. Marsha had been involved in two dozen body recoveries since she started scuba diving. Still, she says, the images of what she found on that ocean floor have stayed with her. Inside the cabin were the remains of four men. All bodies were badly decomposed, but would eventually be identified as Marshall Jenks, 46, Stephen Beltran, 48, Jamal Cooper, 45, and Benjamin Carpetta, 39. The first body Marsha found was chained to the captain's chair, with its hands bound to the polished helm as if he were steering the boat even in death. The body was skeletonized. His skull was missing as well as his right leg below the knee. Just past him was a second body, posed to appear to be standing, his hands fastened to the kitchen table by screws through the bone, and his feet were fastened to the floor by cable staples over his thin metatarsals. The third man was found in the bathroom, his femurs bound to the toilet lid, perched on the toilet as if he were defecating. The fourth body lay in the bed, wrapped in torn sheets, an empty bottle of gin tied with cord to the bones of his hand. In the unedited transcript from her interview with News 12 Long Island, Marsha said, I've seen my fair share of dead bodies. The Suffolk police call me to assist with tricky recoveries every once in a while, usually people who have driven their cars off a bridge or drunk boating collisions. This is something else. I don't know what happened to those people, but it wasn't an accident. Someone arranged it. Someone planned to come back and visit. It's at a decent depth, deeper than most recreational divers would be willing to go. I can't say too much because there's an investigation, but the range of possible suspects is narrow. I worry I might even know the person who did this. It really freaks me out to think that it might be someone in the scuba community I should probably stop talking before I get myself in trouble. There are many inundated towns across America. These towns lie in river valleys that were flooded when those rivers were dammed to provide hydroelectric power and fresh water to neighboring cities. These communities were typically small, impoverished, and quickly forgotten once the waters rose above their homes and shops and churches. Butler, Tennessee lay at the deep center of the Watauga Valley. The town was a beautiful sight, especially when viewed from the lush and wooded Appalachian hills surrounding the valley. The steeple of the Methodist Church could catch your eye from any angle, with its white spire and gold-painted cross. Residents thought it was a comfortable place to live, 
Homes and businesses were nestled into the shade of wooded lots. Private gardens were plentiful, and the town had the largest population of any site dammed by the Tennessee Valley Authority. Located in the forested hills of Appalachia, the industries around Butler were mostly wood-related and include a lumberyard, a furniture maker, and a casket factory. Most of the town worked in some capacity in these industries. In 1948, when the floodgates were closed on the Watauga Dam, 458 square miles flooded along the Watauga River. 735 families were displaced by the dam project. The living weren't the only ones moved. 400 bodies had to be excavated from the graveyards, in fear that so many corpses would taint the water supply. They would later be interred in cemeteries of nearby towns. A few wealthy residents had their homes moved. The houses were hoisted off their foundations with hydraulic lifts and were dropped into flatbed trucks to be driven to a spot at a higher elevation that was aptly named New Butler. However, most of the buildings remained where they were. Much of the town remained in place as the waters rose high above them. One might think that this drowned town would be a playground for scuba divers who want to swim through a modern day Atlantis, but in reality, the dangers flooded valleys pose to recreational divers far outweighs the allure. Trees present some of the major obstacles to divers. After years of being underwater, the trunks of old trees become a spongy mass. A small movement can cause them to collapse and fall on a diver, injuring or trapping them until they run out of air. For 40 years, the waters engulfing Butler went relatively unexplored until a dive team hired by the power company set about installing underwater power cables across the width of the former valley. One hot summer day, the divers geared up and got to work laying cable. The crew was cautious and mindful of obstacles that can endanger the line's integrity. As Hugh Leslie, a veteran diver, cinched his weight belt and turned overboard, he said that the visibility in the water was fair. The former town of Butler took on a brownish haze as he swam with his partner over its streets, guiding the cable that was being unspooled by the boat above. He told the local newspaper, the Watauga Dispatch, that he felt like he was flying above the rooftops and trees. As he slowly guided the large cable around the former Masonic Lodge, his feet set down on the pavement of the main street. Methodically, he kicked his flippers and checked ahead for anything that might cut or crush the line. He rounded the street corner and saw an old home that caught his eye. The trees that surrounded it were still standing, though their leaves had fallen long ago. The sight of this home transfixed him. He told reporters it looked almost manicured and looked after. As he passed in front of the home, gliding along the sidewalk, he saw a shape inside one of the windows. He said he felt like someone was watching him. The house, he would soon learn, had belonged to the Whitakers who had been a prominent family in Butler. The Whitakers were all employed in the lumber industry. The family members consisted of Rose and Jessup Whitaker and their seven children, four sons and three daughters. Jessup and his brothers had worked their way up from the logging camps to owning and managing a small lumber company and sawmill. Their rise in fortune seemed to come at the expense of many others in town. The Whitakers were well known for being a ruthless people Two of Jessup's sons, Bertie and Lang Whitaker, were renowned for the lengths they'd go to to strong-arm competitors and naysayers. One man, who had spent a brief tenure as a journalist for the Watauga Dispatch, wrote widely of their behavior. One op-ed article accused the brothers of firebombing a rival sawmill, which killed the night watchman who had been drunk asleep in the mill at the time. After the article came out, the brothers kidnapped this journalist and tied him 40 feet up a poplar tree leaving the fire department to deploy a full rescue team to get the man down. So intimidating were the Whitaker's tactics that even the heavies and private security from the Pittsburgh Lumber Company were quickly discouraged from encroaching upon their business when a sizable lot for a mill came on the market. The Whitaker house was indeed the residence that the TVA diver had noticed. Something inside the former home had startled him. Curious to the point of recklessness, he swam toward the house, wary of the trees looming over the front yard and entranceway. 
What had he seen, his dive crew asked later, that had made him forego their guidelines about getting near unstable objects like trees? To this he told them, with no uncertainty, I saw someone at the window, looking at me. Hugh swam along the stone walkway that circled the house. The front windows remained intact, and he could make out a living room, arranged nearly as it would have been before the flood. Under the beam of his flashlight, he saw that the rooms were decorated and completely furnished. At first, he thought, it was a trick of the eye. He figured that the roof must have collapsed, and it was only debris strewn about the living room that he saw through the glaze of the glass and murk. But as he got closer and took in the scene, he realized that he was looking at a family congregation. Many figures were posed about the room, mannequins or dolls perhaps, he reasoned, like they have in department stores. Some sat at the couch, some were posted around the kitchen table or the adjoining dining room. Another was sprawled on the rug, like it was relaxing after a big dinner. Still not quite sure of what he was looking at, the diver made the intrepid decision to circle the house for a better vantage. In other windows, he saw additional figures. Through the kitchen window were figures posed in domestic scenes. He thought the mannequins might have been left in place as some sort of joke before the valley was filled with water. Swimming up along the gable of the second floor, he noticed a window missing. The diver peered inside. Tied and chained in place in the master bedroom were two human bodies. Their decomposition had progressed to the point that little flesh clung to the old bones. The skeletons lay side by side on the bed in a seemingly peaceful repose. Immediately, he surfaced to tell his crew of the find. A day later, the FBI arrived at the reservoir, and search and rescue divers were brought in to document the scene. The house was deemed too dangerous to enter, so samples were taken by extendable grips and analyzed for their forensic revelations. At the time, the samples couldn't be analyzed fully or matched to any known persons. It wasn't until 2015 that the case was looked at again, now that the DNA technology had progressed. One of the bodies was identified through DNA results on an Ancestry website, and through process of elimination, determined to be Bertie Whitaker, the son of Jessup Whitaker. Bertie had become estranged from his family in his old age. He was living alone and had not been reported missing. The second body has still not been identified. The house was carefully checked by divers for other victims, but they only found mannequins. The killer had undoubtedly been a diver, killing the victims, then pulling or sinking their bodies underwater to arrange them in this cryptic tableau. The police never had any definitive suspects, even though the pool of people able to pull off this maneuver was certainly limited in the landlocked state of Tennessee. Many locals believe that this was a revenge killing by someone who had been wronged or a family member murdered by the ruthless Whitaker family during their rise to regional prominence. The bodies were recovered and Bertie Whitaker was entombed in the family plot in New Butler. A week after the headstone was placed over Bertie's grave, someone entered the cemetery after dark and took a sledgehammer to the grand stone, breaking it into pieces. Was it the same person who sank Bertie to the bottom of the Watauga Reservoir? No one knows who desecrated Bertie's grave, but the Whitakers have a long list of enemies. And as we all know, old grudges don't always end at the grave. And a quick word from our sponsors. Tip Top Tarps. The only tarps when it comes to routine dismemberment. Tip Top Tarps should be your number one choice for covering up your little whoopsie. Listeners, you know us. We like to test every product that we endorse. And we can say without a doubt that our Tip Top Tarp is the best tarp we have ever owned. We dragged a bull carcass five miles in a Tip Top Tarp. And you know what? There wasn't a single tear. Tip Top Tarps are 100% waterproof 
and are great for protecting you when you're digging that shallow grave. Throw it over yourself and not a drop of rain touches you. The Tip Top Tarp is such a joy to use, you'll wish you had more messes to clean up. Use the promo code WORMS at checkout. Cherry Blossom Candies are our first choice when it comes to rendering a subject docile and compliant. Cherry Blossom Candies aren't mind control agents, they're a face slap in the right direction. Are you a teacher trying to get an unruly class in line? Or are you just a parent having trouble herding a monstrous brood of your own making? Cherry Blossom Candies can lend a hand and render even the most disruptive child docile and compliant. Cherry Blossom Candies special concoction has been user tested the world over by despots and fed up parents alike. Our customers report that they are relieved they chose the best name in confectionery compliancy. Just read our reviews coming out of Turkmenabat. Cherry Blossom Candies, we've got everything under control. Thanks again for listening in. And remember, the next time you feel like going for a swim, don't. Bye. Bye Bye-bye.